and uh, and we are recording so welcome cornerstone we have part two of our interview with dave and diane norman uh, they're working with natives in colville washington and we'd like to be able to get to know them a little better and know how to be praying for them and would love for you to get to know um, the ministry and uh, how to be praying especially for native peoples in our land so first of all, um, tell us some cultural differences that you've been finding as you as you interact with the native peoples compared to how you grew up. Well, there's there's a lot of them, and one of the important things in cross cultural ministry and missions is um, you have to. Um, you, you have to force yourself to not say, why did they do that? That is really weird. That's the normal reaction, whether it's from kids or adults, to something that's different than we're used to. So there's a whole process that you get training in and you have to get used to of, uh, of saying, instead of that's weird, uh, that's that's really interesting. Why why do you do that? And I, I I remember the first time I was taken out when I was working in the schools, and um, a native uh, a guy wanted to uh, help me go get some teepee poles. And he we went out we went out to the place where he knew we could we could cut some poles legally, and he he stopped. He said, "Well, we have to." Um, we have to uh, pray and thank the, the trees for giving themselves to us, uh, giving their lives to us so that we can use these things. So we have to pray. And so uh, he led in prayer. And then I, as we were just talking and working, I said, Ken, um, I'm just curious, you know, I know you believe in creator and you know obviously creator made these trees why why do you think i mean why do you thank the trees rather than creator and i didn't i just did it like a real open question like that not trying to and he had some kind of an answer for it but i mean there's those kind of things that when you they're just different from what you do so um one of the ones we we notice is is the way they dress um if any of you have ever been to a powwow probably most of you haven't although they have them all around the country in different native cultures but they they wear different kind of clothing for their dancing the women and men and it's actually especially in large powers, it's spectacular, gorgeous. They, they spend years, the elders, the grandmas and grandpas spend years uh, making their kids regalia. So it's all handmade and, and depending on what part of the country you're in, it's just, it's just dazzlingly beautiful. Each one is different, just like God made. No snowflakes identical, it's, that's what you feel like. You will never see anybody alike dressed alike in a powwow. I think one of the key things when you talk about, or with Native people, you don't talk about um, costumes. Costumes are something, for Native people, costumes are something that you wear when you're trying to be something that you're not really, like at Halloween. Regalia is something that they wear to show who they really are. So it's very offensive to to comment on their costume as opposed to their regalia. So that's a key thing is it's a regalia, not a costume. Another one of the differences in Native Americans is prayer. They dance their prayers. And um, I grew up in a small conservative, small town in Minnesota, Ogilvy. And when we prayed, we were told you fold your hands, you bow your head, you close your eyes. That's how you pray. Native Americans dance their prayers. Where I grew up, my mom wrote a note when I was in high school or junior high, I think, and we were going to do square dancing in physical education in PE. And so she wrote a note to have me excused because we didn't dance. So for me to go from that kind of a, a culture to a culture where they dance their prayers was a big jump for me. Um, they have special 
dances that and David was talking about how spectacular and how beautiful the regalia is when you go to a powwow you'll see people who are um, who wear these jingle dresses the the women and they're all made with jingles there's 365 jingles one jingle for every day of the year and it takes them a year to make their dress but that is specifically uh, a prayer dress and the sometimes at a powwow uh, if someone is sick they'll call the jingle dancers to come and do a dance for the people that are sick so it's specifically a prayer dance they have dances that are um the stomp dance the the men will wear they look like there's big fringes either ribbons or yarn and it's um uh a grass dance and what they do is they stomp down the grass so that before the powwow starts there's no snakes there's no rodents uh, it's it's a way of protecting the people um, they have fancy dancers and the the gals the young women they look like butterflies when they flit around in their beautiful regalia they have traditional dancers so um, it's learning about their different dances and what they mean and, and then appreciating it for what they are. The uh, another one <clears throat> difference, cultural difference is huge in the native culture is is time, how we view time. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about being early for a meeting. You know, my brother who worked, you know, in in the business world was always and in the military too, was always 15 minutes early to every time he came to work. And, uh, and it's bad, you know, the average time and the average non-native person will wait for a person. If they've made an appointment, they don't show up. You know, it's about 10 minutes, they don't show up, they leave. And uh, that's, that's our white cultural way of doing things, European cultural thing, time oriented. And they don't even have the, I mean, the late and early are not part of the native culture. I, uh, and I, because I'm more of a storyteller, I remember the first time my native boss sent me to a, a national Indian education conference it, because it happened to be in St. Paul, Minnesota at one of the big armories there. And I said, all you have to pay is the fee, Carol. And I, I can stay with family. There's no motel fees. I've got family all over Minneapolis, St. Paul area and I can have access to a car. So all you've got out of our budget to train me with the top leaders in the country is, is, is basically the, the airfare, you know, and the fee. So I went out there and I'm, I knew my way around out there. That's the freeway. I knew where exactly how to go. I'd driven that my whole life and they were having construction on the freeway, I-94. And so I got, I got nervous. I'm going to be, it, because you flip back under pressure, you flip back to your own culture. And I started thinking I'm going to be late. And I wanted to find a place to park for free. And I realized I'm going to be late. If I go around searching the area for a parking place, I'm going to even be later. And the tension was mounting. And even though I had all this cross-cultural training under pressure, we, we usually fold. And so I finally parked underneath the dome, the state, the big stadium thing that was it. There was, there was two, 3,000 native leaders from around the country there. And I parked at the most expensive stuff underneath. And I remember getting out of my car, grabbing my little briefcase, running through the parking lot, not noticing there's native people sauntering through the parking lot all around me. I ran in to open the doors. I looked for the for my for N because it was all alphabetized, organized. I found N for Norman, and I went over there, and I got my stuff, and I knew I knew I was late, so I went up to the door. The auditorium doors were closed, and I peeked inside because I was hoping I could sit in the back and not disturb the meeting. It was already twenty minutes late by my my cultural definition and there was half a dozen native leaders standing up at the, at the podium talking there wasn't there wasn't a hundred people there's probably 60 people in the room and this is 15 minutes after it's supposed to start 
it didn't get going for another, you know, 40 minutes. And, and then as I suddenly realized that, it came back to me, oh, yeah, that's another difference in the culture. So that's called event time. You show up. It would be like having our church service in the morning and over an hour. We still do get some people who come <laughs> late, but it, no one would be concerned that you weren't there at the approximate starting time of 10 o'clock or something like that. So anyway, it's just one of the differences. You feel those pressures when you go cross-cultural. Mm -hmm. so one of the things is, um, because they're relationship oriented people um, and everyone's related, everyone's your cousin, when you get together, we, we're, we're um, productive oriented. And so we will ask, uh, where do you work? Um, where do you live? But they are relationship oriented. So the kinds of questions you would ask native people when you're first meeting them are something like, uh, so who are your parents? Uh, what tribe are you from? Those are the kinds of things that you want to ask to build a relationship. They could care less where you work. They want to know who you're related to. Um, yeah, the first, the first question I ask, um, if I'm at a restaurant and I'm a native person is waiting on it. I won't tell because they're not at a power or anything. So they, I can't tell the difference usually, but they will notice what I'm, if I wear this, like I'm doing today, they assume I'm native. Well, usually my, my ring that I have on here, you can't see it, it's made out of turquoise. It's a, it's a Navajo wedding ring. All native people know what that is. So that's all I have to have on or a belt that has turquoise on it and at the restaurant the native waiter or waitress will say nice drink and then I know what they're doing because I've had cross cultural drink they're not commenting about my ring they are really saying I'm native are you too <laughs> but you have to be trained to, to know that and so then the next, as soon as they say nice ring, I say, thank you. What tribe are you from? If they've commented on something I'm wearing and I ask them what tribe they're from, they will immediately tell me what it is. In most cases, because we've been in ministry 35 years, I know somebody from that tribe. So then my response is, do you know so-and-so? It doesn't make any difference whether they know them or not. They usually will know the name, the family name. They may not know them personally, but instantly we have an intimate relationship where they want to sit down and talk with you with those two or three questions. Mm -hmm. That's how powerful the relationship piece is compared to our culture. What, what do you do for a living? You know, type things. So anyway, it's just fascinating stuff. The other thing they do is they really honor the elders. Um, white hair is a value in the Native culture. They value wisdom. Uh, we tend to value youth and athletic prowess. And but for them, it's what have you learned in your life? Um, if you go to a potluck, the elders always go first. Elders and veterans. The kids will, uh, if they'll, they'll always announce it being, does anybody need help? And then the young people will go get the plates and bring it to an elder that say cannot get around easily. They sit at places of honor. They always make sure they have a front row seat at a, um, at a powwow or any kind of native event. So the elders are honored. And the elders, uh, if you can find a chair near an elder at a powwow, that is the best way to get to know the thing. The elders are usually gentle and kind, even though they've had horrible experiences of persecution through the cultural stuff in the last 500 years, but they still 
they, they're nice people. So when you just go sit, they will start chatting with you and they'll ask you about your family. And you'll ask them, which one is your granddaughter out there, the dancing or whatever. But it's, it's um, yeah, you wanna get to know and support the elders in any way you can. You'll try to fit, you'll try to learn some of the key words, greeting words and things so you can use them with the elders. And as soon as they know you're trying, then it opens up the door for relationship. So it's a They're also a very <clears throat> giving culture. Um, if someone goes out and kills a deer, <laughs> the best parts are given to the elders. They don't keep them for themselves. They don't fill their freezer with their, their venison. They would share it among the people. Um, when you make your first drum, you don't let, like, this is the very first drum I made, you know, and I would want to take it and put it on my wall and display it. But for Native people, they give that first drum that they make or the first pair of earrings that they make, they would give away. It's just, our house is filled with Native stuff, not stuff that we've purchased, but because Native people are giving and they have given us so many, so many gifts. Okay, so what would you say are the, some of the key things that we should know if we're gonna be interacting with First Nations? What are some of the key cultural differences that are really important for us to, to be aware of? Well, one of the things is you, you know when you're accepted when they start teasing you. It's, it's a culture of humor. It's, it's, it's dry humor, but there's, it just happens constantly, this teasing that goes on. And um, if you tend to be a real straight-laced, white, black, white person, as far as you're thinking, it goes right over your head and you think they're being serious and you, you get, you know, and they're not. And then, and they, they get excited when they get you. So <laughs> Diane gets caught at this cause she's more of a prophet <laughs> type person, but they're, uh, they love to catch you in humor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, shaking hands with them. Now, mm -hmm. again, they've, your context is there. But at a powwow, you don't shake hands like we shake hands. I was taught in businessmen, you keep your hand straight ahead. Uh, so you don't let somebody push you over and put you. There's very techniques in business. You shake hands, it's a firm handshake, a couple of shakes. And that's that works in our business world. That's that's we that's where they watch you. If you're kind of got a weak Nabby Pamby Hand, they thought, what's wrong with this guy? That's literally that much difference. But in the native culture, in a Pawa, especially with the elders, you just kind of grab the end of their fingers and just touch. There's no grabbing at all because, from their perspective, that's being pushy and controlling, and they've got 500 years of negative stuff of us breaking trees and, and being pushy, pushing them off their land, all those kind of things. That's so even the handshake is gentle. Is, is gentle and kind and respectful. So there's little things that, that can make a huge difference. If you know them, when you run into a native person, they will love. Those are probably some key ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think maybe we'll move into a little bit more of the history of Native Americans. Um, I guess if I were there in person with you, I would want to ask them questions. How many of you have been to a powwow? And what's your reaction to a powwow? What's your takeaway? How many of you have been to a reservation or even understand what a reservation is? Um, it's government assigned land where native people were forced to live. Lots of things were promised, but little was follow through on. Mm -hmm. What's it like to live on a reservation? There was a lot of times no food, no work. They weren't allowed to hunt. They weren't allowed to leave. 
they were taken from their ancestral homes and moved to different areas that they weren't used to. What's a boarding school? Um, some of us are familiar with what a boarding school is, but for Native people, their kids were basically kidnapped, taken by government agents and put in a school where they were forced to live sometimes as long as 10 years before they would go home again. Many of them tried to run away. Many of them were abused physically, sexually, emotionally. It was a very, very difficult time. I remember the first time I went to a women's retreat and a native retreat, and one of the speakers was a boarding school survivor. And I sat in those sessions and tears just ran down my face the entire time. People sitting in front of me, some of the women would just be sobbing, shaking because they were reliving. The speaker was very graphic, very honest, very vulnerable. And it was um, heart wrenching. They're just incredible scars of humiliation and pain that these children went through. Um, because of the history, there's a long process of building the trust with Native people because we've violated them as a people group. And I just want to share a story. Um, this is a few years ago now, but I went, I went back home and uh, a good friend of mine that I went all 12 years to the same school with, we were cheerleaders together. We used to double date. Um, in fact, her first husband was killed in Vietnam. They were married less than a year. And then she remarried. I didn't really ever get to know her new husband very well. We, because when I come back to Minnesota, we I call her up and say, "I'm in town. Can we do lunch together?" And um, and so we would get together, but it wasn't very often. And so this is a couple of years ago. I went back home, and um, so I called my friend Donna. I said, "Donna, can we get together? I'm in town just for, you know, a short time." So we got together and she was really subdued. And um, finally over the course of our meal, she shared with me that she had recently found out that her husband, they had not been able to have children and so they had adopted a, a little girl. And she was uh, in her teen years now, but um, she, Donna had just recently found out that her daughter had been abused by her husband. And it had been an ongoing, she didn't know it until her daughter tried to commit suicide. And of course she was devastated. She was um, embarrassed that this could have even happened behind her back in her own home. And um, her husband's reaction was, okay, it's done. It's not gonna happen again. It's over, let's forget it, let's move on. And he just wanted to push it away and like pretend it never existed. And I think that's, I share it because that's so similar to what's happened in the Native culture. Um, we have violated Native people and it was done, these were government run schools, but they were operated by the church, uh, mostly Catholic, some Presbyterian, but... Um, Anglican in Canada. But, <laughs> what native people saw was church people supposedly god-fearing people inflicted this kind of pain upon them and so many of the children were abused and we look at it and we say that's in the past it's done it's over it's not happening now so let's just move on and we want to forget it and we say get over it and um when that trust has been violated it takes a long time to rebuild the trust again with Native people. And that's where we come in as missionaries. And we're coming in really to represent who Jesus is to Native people. We want to love them, value them, honor them, respect their culture. Uh, obviously, scripture is always the plumb line, um, and everything has to be based on does this in any way compromise scripture? At that point, you draw a line. 
but in any way that we can embrace them as a people group and what their values are, we want to do that, that we want to rebuild the trust with them. And that's why it takes so long with native people to get to the point where they, I look at it and I think, <clears throat> really, I am humbled anytime a native person will come to me and share their heart and be open and accept me and love me because their history has, it's so filled with pain mm -hmm. that for them to be able to see beyond my white skin is really important to me. <clears throat> Do you wanna share a little bit here? Well, just uh, we we've, we've been we've actually had some seminars at churches where we've taken over a gymnasium, and just to visually have the people experience a little bit of what it was like in, in, to be native, uh, and so we would uh, go back and and read different declarations through the through the actually through the centuries that had been made uh, starting with columbus and some of these other things and and each time we would take land away from we'd start out with blankets all over the entire gym floor and the people of the church standing on those blankets and then we would say um, okay this declaration came and then we took this amount of land so we'd have them removed so so you went in the period of an hour or so presentation, you went from a gym floor covered with, um, with blankets to one blanket left somewhere in the, in the gym with, um, and then we would also have the people leave. If they were died because of some disease or because of some massacre or whatever, we would, so you ended up with a small, at the end of the hour, you ended up with a small number of people on one blanket just to have them experience. And as you're standing around the outside, when you're participating as a church and you're standing around the outside and looking at this, finally, just because of the activity, you start to realize what has happened in this country. And nobody talks about it. I didn't learn it in school. And we still hide it. Canada has finally admitted that they have done the horrible atrocities that have been done. They have finally had the Reconciliation Commission. They've spent years on this. We've been up to some of these sessions and they have tr truly owned up to it and are trying to bring reconciliation uh, and equality back into <clears throat> the people but it's uh it's a long our, our our country hasn't done that yet we've paid lip service to it but there's been nothing nothing done i i think maybe the things you guys do down there when they have that ride to where the mankato you know where they had the hangings of the native people uh in mankato there uh, that was one of the you don't call it a massacre i guess but that's really what it was from the native perspective and the fact that the churches along there open up their doors and their barns and stuff to the horse that really touched my heart first time we came and i heard from you guys um that you're doing something that's real that's tangible that's giving that's serving all the stuff god tells us to do and you're doing that for these people because of the history you're showing christian love <laughs> to them providing food whatever they want place for their horses because it's bitter cold they do this walk in the middle of december and you know what it's like there every year after some of them do it their suicides i've seen the videos on this there there there's young teenagers who just can't take it so the suicide rate is the highest you know and in in any culture you know because of this horrible stuff that's done so that's the kind of history that we don't want we don't like talking about that that we that we are part of that our ancestors are part of that the reason we have land in montana is because we we took it the government said okay there's free land you, you can have it but what happened to the native people at that time even diana minnesota her dad 
can remember, um, there was Native people camping along the Groundhouse River near near where he was living, and they were just hiding out because the Minnesotans were, there had been a massacre there, and I think it was 1944, or, or um, anyway, there was um, <clears throat> Little Crow led that rebellion like, from the Lakota, and um, anyway, there was a, a war, and then as a result of that uh, war, because they were starving them, you know, there was, there's always reasons that we'll say, but those stories were never told. Kids weren't told in school. So those who wanted to pursue some kind of reconciliation could do it. They weren't even told the stories. I wasn't told the stories. I, I've heard more from elders than I have from books. So, but it's changing. <laughs> the, the good news is they're <laughs> forgiving people. And so uh, they've, they've are gradually allowing us to come in to like m growing number of native leaders have become believers. Yeah. Navajo, the chair and the vice chair of the tribe are believers. The Muckleshoot tribe right out where we used to live um, in, the, in Tacoma area, there are suburb Auburn, uh, the Christian natives there, the chair of that tribe is a Christian also, a number of the tribal council is Christian. So they're raising, because of the coronavirus and so many people are dying, I think, well, the last I heard was 48 on the res down there in, in Navajo land, but uh, they, they've raised $6,000 to send down to them to help. But it's the Christians, and so what's happening is, as we as Christians walk our talk, um, including the native Christians, they end up in leadership mm. because it's the principles we've learned from scripture. And so there's a growing number at, at top national levels in different Christian native organizations. I mean, not Christian, or, but just organizations mm. that are Christian leadership now. So some neat things are happening <clears throat> um, as as that our our organization or our group that we're, we're part of in Tacoma now is planning a, a conference, a, a prayer conference um, this fall. It was supposed to be this spring. This, it was supposed to be uh, the the end of um, this month. This month it was supposed to be, and they had to cancel it because of the virus. So they reset it. The native speaker, who is a PhD and professor up in Canada. Uh, is only day available is September 12th. So we're trying to work towards that. We don't know what's going to happen with this coronavirus, but um, but there's, there's neat things happening, uh, and it's native leadership. It, it's so exciting to see that. Yeah. Since I moved out here, I, I, I met native friends. We've tried to start at Wisdom Circle, but I am not going to start it without two other Native Christian leaders. So there's a majority making decisions. Yeah. We have to turn over their responsibility to them because they know their people better than I do, even though I've lived in it, studied it for 35 years. So I'm, I'm actively letting them, wanting them to take the leadership so I can just be part of its support because that's that's where I think it has to go. So, Thanks for sharing start. that with us. Uh, yeah, just to hear some of the the really beautiful things that have taken place, it's just it's good to hear that and to, to know that there's there's a lot of hope there too. And, and so there is a lot of hope. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that with us, and uh, we look forward to hearing more about your your ministry with with the First Nations, and uh, look forward to having you on again in the future.